everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Today we're going to talk about Apollo 17 50 years ago going on the moon with our good friend Terry White. Hey Terry. Hey, how you doing today? Good. Great, great. We sometimes have Terry on because he was a shuttle garage manager is what I call it. He was looking over those beautiful national assets, our space shuttle for your 30-year career. Correct. And uh, I actually made a mistake, thought uh, Terry was scheduled to talk about the shuttle today, and I'm scheduled to talk about Apollo 17 with our good friend and co-producer, Marty Winkle, who his his uh, gloved handprints are all over these lunar modules. Marty, how are you? I'm good, Mark. How are you doing? Good. Well, we, we're glad to have uh, Terry here to talk about anything. He's a few years older than me. He was. Uh, where were you? When Apollo 17 was launched 50 years ago, going to the moon for the I'd last time. I'd just gotten out of the Air Force and returned from England, and I was here working in uh, Brevard County. Were you? Yes. Did, so. where, did you ever think you'd have such a career at the shuttle No, 50 I, years ago she did? No, I did not then. It was later on when I was working for an oil company that uh, I heard that they were hiring out the Space Center for uh, mechanics and electricians to work on the new space shuttle program, so I applied and got hired as a mechanic to work on the orbiters. Hmm. Well, you were in Vietnam a few years before that, yes. and uh, God when, bless you for your service there. What, what was your job in the Air Force? Uh, over there, I was a aircraft crash rescue specialist, and I flew air rescue for a year or so. Well, that's ironic that Marty Winkle, co-producer in that first invasion of Vietnam, Marty was there, and you kind of had a similar rescue career, Marty, didn't you? Yes, yeah, so I went to call a combat recovery team. Um, That's so interesting. Both of them. You know, a crew, member, crew member on a helicopter and we go in and... Uh, bring back the wounded yeah, and bring back the, we did, the yeah. not wounded. And then didn't you go back in a third time and blow up everything so the Viet Cong couldn't get our secrets? Or is that, a, is that just Hollywood TV shows I've seen? <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't do that third time. I just wonder if you went and it blew, blew up stuff, stuff too. No, no, no ain't there. Sk Skorsky helicopters, right? Yeah, US 34Ds. Same helicopters that picked up the Mercury capsules. Interesting. And our green screen behind here that Marty chose is uh, we're looking at uh, the, the Earth and uh, what two antennas are we looking at? Marty, get your little pointer out there, please, sir. Radar. Okay. That's what's tracking right now, tracking the command module. And that's the uh, that's a UHF antenna. Uh huh. Um, I really forget what that is. The S band antenna is on the other side. You can't see that. All right. All right. Well, you were electrical engineer, and he worked for Grumman, and mostly inside this vehicle. Uh, checking the switches and everything. How many switches did you tell me were inside that lunar module? There's 300 switches, dials, uh, talkbacks, oh. uh, circuit breakers. Just 300. Just 300. How many of those, those beautiful space shuttles have in their cockpit? More than 1,200. <laughs> more than 1,200. So a lot more going on there. But uh, 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 Marty, please tell us the way Marty likes it said correctly. That the, that the lunar module is a, a unique vehicle. It's never been duplicated because it is. Well, you want me to say it? Yeah, I want you to say it because I always mess it up. I always leave something out. It's the first and to this date, the only manned true space vehicle designed to fly strictly in a vacuum of space. It's the first vehicle designed to land and then take off. And it's the first vehicle to fly standing up. And it's also the first vehicle, manned vehicle, uh, designed without a heat shield to return to Earth. And in 50 years, folks, 50 years, it has not yet been duplicated. That's kind of sad in a way, isn't it, Terry? Or how do you it, think it, of that? It is, yeah. It is sad that we've never gone back to the moon and we're finally planning on doing it now. But it's amazing that that vehicle <clears throat> landed on the moon six different times and then came back off the moon and rendezvoused with the command module to come back to Earth. And, of course, it's two parts. It had two engines, the one that landed, the descent stage 
all six descent stages we can see from lunar reconnaissance orbiter photographs. The ascent stage, one of the simplest ever created, uh, with hypergolic fuels that ignited when they touched each other, took them back up. This was disposed, uh, usually crashed into the moon. And uh, I'm so proud to know Marty and think about him. And uh, we go out to the Kennedy Space Center occasionally together. And when Marty's with you at the Saturn V, center and you're looking at lm9 that is the real artifact that was going to be apollo 15s and yeah they swear he's just he's always pointing out something fabulous out there just like you do on the shuttle yeah and and if you're interested i'm sure marty will sell you one of these <laughs> lunar landers that's up there on the moon <laughs> there you go exactly exactly but uh, uh proud of our apollo heritage you know our american space museum uh, for over 20 years has been celebrating the birth of America's space age. The Mercury Gemini problem programs were entirely about beating the Russians to the moon. And we did it twice in 1969, fulfilling President Kennedy's uh, a challenge to us. And uh, uh, I think that is really says it all. We did it in July and June in 1969. Correct. And uh, take that, you commie uh, <laughs> you guys out there in there. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, we did before we talk about the launch 50 years ago at 12:33 a.m. Uh, on December 7th, 1972. Uh, Terry, I had the great pleasure of being around some of your friends today at a birthday party uh, for this gentleman, uh, Mr. Hugh Harris, turns 90 tomorrow. And there was a little uh, get together once a month that he organizes with other space workers. And that's Mr. Jay Honeycutt on the left, former Kennedy Space Center director. But more importantly, Mr. Honeycutt is, is, is one of the really behind the scenes people of, and, of the entire American space program. Yeah, you and, agree? and a personal friend. So yeah, yeah, personal friend of yours. Yes. Yeah. He has mentored and that's uh, John tribe beside him there. Uh, again, a, an amazing individual. John Tribe spent most of his career with hypergolic fuels at North American Aviation, that command module. Uh, both great guys, but Mr. Hugh Harris, thank you uh, for being on our program. He's going to be on next Wednesday. We're going to talk about Christmases in space, as well as some of the shuttles, there's eight shuttles in the month of December. But uh, 90 years old tomorrow, born in Cleveland, Ohio where he started his journalism career and worked up there at the, uh, um, it was called the John Glenn. What was it yeah. called back then? Uh, on the lake, one of the NASA test centers. Um, um, oh. Yeah, it alludes yeah, me yeah, to. Yeah, it'll come back to us old timers there. But a lot, a, lot, a lot of great people came from Ohio, including me. So <laughs> That's right, and me. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I just happened to have uh, 25 Ohio knots here. <laughs> I okay. need a paper to, to talk about there. So anyway, have a lot of fun here. But uh, God bless you, Mr. Hugh Harris, 90 years. And he is as lucid as Terry White is when we talk to him on, on Stay Curious. So look forward to seeing you, Hugh, on Wednesday. And thank you, Mr. Honeycutt and John Tribe for supporting our museum the way you do, because they certainly uh, do some things behind the scenes for us. Well, Apollo 17, there's the emblem of it. Uh, controversial because um, Joe Engel was uh, scratched for a true geologist, uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt. Uh, a trivia question, if you know out there, folks. Harrison Jack Schmidt's middle name without looking it up. All right. Do you know it by chance? No. Okay. Yeah, someone out there will know it. Marty's writing down our, our fans out there that are watching today. So uh, what is... Uh, Harrison uh, Jack Schmidt's middle name, without uh, looking it up there. So he, he was a he was an interesting guy. When they used to induct astronauts, and they still do, into the Hall of Fame every year. When we were still flying the space shuttles, all of the returning astronauts would come up there with their spouses and tour around one of the hangars and get to walk around the orbiters and that. And uh, and he was always. A pleasure to talk to and talk about what he did. And he says, yeah, they finally decided maybe we should carry a geologist so they could say, hey, don't pick up that rock, pick up that rock. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so, he was known as Dr. Rock. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I want you here for uh, is, is these stories. You interacted as a tour guide to a lot of 
Apollo era people, didn't you? Uh, yes, all of them that returned back for that, we would escort them around and help answer their questions and that. And then, you know, a lot of them had questions about the shuttle because they did not, you know, fly the orbiters. It, they were at, at the end of the Apollo program, uh, you know, a lot of them went on to other tasks mm -hmm. than that. You know, a few of them, like John Young, went over to shuttle. But yeah, so it was, it was really interesting to see those gentlemen and to talk to them about about what they had done so so you got a, a, a couple moonwalkers J uh, jack schmidt walking around maybe uh gene cernan there and so forth uh how did the the space workers i mean uh, uh look at them well our policy was you don't disturb guests so the workers are supposed to continue working if one of the guests has a question for them or wants to say something. But, you know, people didn't go up and routinely, uh, you know, ask them for an autograph or anything. It was just a pleasure to see these returning astronauts. And then, you know, some of the former shuttle astronauts would show up as well. And people recognized some of them or had, you know, firsthand acquaintances with them. But, yeah, it was just uh, very interesting to to talk to these people. So. Very good. Here with Terry. Terry Weiss joined us here on this retrospect of Apollo 17 launched 50 years ago. Boy, you never thought half century would be so fresh in your mind, Terry. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, you look back and see the things that trigger your memory and all. Oh, I remember doing this with him and yeah. that. So. I remember how much that cost. Yeah. Uh, I could get two of those for just a dollar. Now I got to pull a five dollar bill out to get one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let's look at some pretty pictures here. Before, this is 50 years apart. That is uh, Steve Nolte, a friend of our museum's photograph of Apollo 17's 1255 AM night launch. And there is the Space Launch System Artemis I roaring off the pad uh, November 29th, I think that was. Uh, uh, anyway, kind of a 50 year apart contrast that Tom Usiak put together for us. That's his baby brother, Mark. UCX photograph on the right there, and Steve Nolte's been a friend of a friend of theirs, so okay. kind it, of a neat it, look. It, it surprised me about this launch because everybody said the Artemis would be so much, the SLS would be so much more powerful mm -hmm. than the Apollo. But at my house, it didn't shake my house like the Apollo used to. So it's been a while since I saw an Apollo launch. But yeah, the the well, a couple of weeks afterwards, you know, uh, it depended where you were. Definitely, there are some atmospheric things going on, but Mike Leinbach that launched the last 37 shuttles was on top of the Launch Control Center, right beside the VAB, and he told me he was completely blown away. It was spectacular, bigger than any shuttle launch he ever saw. Oh, yeah, we knew it was going to be more now, powerful he was inside shuttle. for a lot of shuttle yeah, launches, yeah. though, and not outside on top of the roof. But Oh, yeah, it was uh, expected to be a lot stronger than a yeah, than shuttle, yeah. but... Uh, then, uh, and, and Marty, where you were at, you, uh, what was your impression after selling all those hundreds of t-shirts for the museum over there at Space View Park? I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, I was a little di disappointed because I've watched every Apollo launch and every shuttle launch from three miles away. And now I'm 10 miles away. So... It was the same <laughs> yeah, you're spoiled, all right. <laughs> Duh, every, I've seen every Apollo, every shuttle launch from three miles away. Yeah. Ten miles don't cut it, but well, the, the uh, Apollo, it, 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 no, I expected some rattling of windows, and there, we didn't get a lot of noise over here. I've heard noisier uh, Atlas V launches, yeah. and uh, uh, actually, and the yeah, Falcon it, Heavy, I thought, was was noisier. Yeah, uh, the, the atmosphere and the direction the vehicle's going when it leaves the mm -hmm. pad. You know, because I live south of the space center, so you know if it's going on a northeastern direction, we get a lot more noise and vibration. That, but yeah. So, well, looking back 50 years ago, uh, here is a sketch made of the Apollo 17 launch by the late Mr. Paul Callie. Hello, Chris. Callie, his son, is also a well-known, renowned uh, space artist that we featured on our program, and Chris is. Uh, become a, a good partner of our museum and shared this sketch of his dad's and the story behind it is that uh, he thinks uh, uh, Chris is a little younger than us so he's uh, 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 what are what were you Chris probably about 10 years old and he he remembers that uh, possibly Deke Slayton arranged for this station wagon 
for Callie, his dad uh, and his uh, brother, sister, and mom to go out uh, and watch the launch from somewhere on the KSC property. Of course, he's young. You don't know exactly where, but I said it kind of looks like he was at the press site or that area. And uh, Paul Callie uh, sketched this on top of the hood of a, a uh, station wagon on a 16 by 20 sketch pad. And uh, Chris remembers, he said, I uh, he first remembers it's a long wait. I think it was like a 930 launch that got pushed back to 1233. He kept falling asleep in the car. And then Chris says he remembers the bright flash uh, and uh, he felt the heavy rumble. He just remembers the rumbling power of it uh, on there. And in fact, he said the rumbling power of it reminds him of his dad's uh, artwork called Power to Go that we have on t-shirts there. Oh yeah, let me get rid of that. There you go. Power to Go, Marty, there we go. That's the Power to Go, that is the Atlas, I mean, that's a, the Saturn V rocket lifting off the pad. Uh, and there's some uh, green screen stuff going on there. But uh, spectacular. This is a two-story mural in Huntsville okay. at the uh, U.S. Rocket Center there. So thank you for sharing your dad's photograph or photograph sketch uh, of the uh, launch. And he, uh, Chris has got some other things he's going to share with us this week. Uh, some new artwork inspired by Apollo 17 that he's going to show us. So uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing that story, Chris Callie. Well, this is what it looked like going to the moon, our spaceship, uh, as they're separating uh, uh, in lunar orbit. But imagine they're, they're to connected uh, like this model. And, uh, you know, I, I, love, I love telling people that this is, this is the spaceship. This is the moon ship, okay? And, and today's moonship is going to look quite different, all right? Uh, it's not going to be two vehicles going to the moon. Well, we'll talk about that in a second because we would not have gone to the moon as efficiently maybe without a gentleman named John Hobalt. Okay. You know who John Hobalt is? Uh, right. to put you on the spot there, but this is called the Lunar uh, Orbit Rendezvous where we rendezvoused and docked in lunar orbit instead of Earth orbit, Uh and taking the vehicle all the way there. So, uh, uh, and there is Mr. Uh, Hobalt. Uh, he is honored out at Space View Park on our, uh, gee, uh, uh, on our, uh, I don't know, on our uh, shuttle, our, our Apollo Monument over there at Space View Park. And uh, quite a seminal person of the, the history of the space program. Uh, there's a book that the young sung hero they call him of the Apollo lunar landings there, John Hobalt. Uh, this is the Artemis profile, is we're going to have a, a space station orbiting the moon called Gateway. See that at the bottom where the moon is going up and down there in the center? That um, is where Artemis, uh, Orion, has been for the last uh, 17, 18 days, coming back Sunday. All right. And what people really don't understand, Terry, has not been explained very well. The Orion spacecraft is the Uber or taxi to the Gateway Space Station. And it's not even shown here, but they don't show the lunar lander there. Uh, uh, it is this. <laughs> Elon Musk's a Starship is what we're landing on the moon. So I have yet to see a NASA photo showing this on the other side of the Gateway, waiting to take astronauts to the moon that have come from Earth in Orion. But as we look at this 200-foot structure on the surface of the moon, that hopefully will have enough fuel to launch off the moon. And can find a level enough spot to land it. And if they get down on the surface from a 200-foot elevator, we're being, I'm going to be a little facetious and skeptical here because this has not been worked out, folks, uh, uh, really. And, and so, but this is what the proposal NASA gave the money to SpaceX to build our moon lander there. But that's not what the moon lander looked like. There's, there's the Artemis uh, 1 in the bay. We heard from uh, Nick Thomas this week that the uh, Orion 2 capsule, the service module from ESA, are all there in the okay. orbit and processing facility. And their misshoots working on the tank. And the SRBs will be shipped here uh, at the beginning of the year for... Good. 
for the next launch there. So uh, going back to the moon and let's talk about, we got a question there. Yeah, Amanda Chambers is asking, which craft first took humans into, into space? Amanda Chambers is asking, which craft took the first image from space? No, took oh. the first human into space. That, that would be the Russians. That would be a Vosk, Vostok spacecraft, a one-man spacecraft, took uh, in, in April 12th, 1961. He actually did like seven-eighths of an orbit around yes. the Earth. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then our one-man Mercury capsule was its equivalent. And then we had the two-man uh, shuttle, I mean two-man mm -hmm. Gemini and three-man Apollo. They had the two-man Vosk Hod, not Vostok, that they only did two missions with. And then they went into the Soyuz spacecraft that they've been using for over 40 years. So we got a lot of friends watching today. I have you help me list our list here of our orange notes that uh, uh, we have here today. Dave uh, Stangy's watching. Doug Forrest, another talented artist uh, in Los Angeles. Had a good day. Carlton Bailey. Hi, Cynthia Rossi. Uh, uh, Tom and Mark Usiak, of course, watching us. And Chris Kelly. Uh, again, thank you for sharing. You're going to see some uh, some new original artwork later this uh, Saturday, or uh, we'll do it Friday with Chris Kelly. Robert Laws in Dundee, Scotland. Why don't you read a couple of those names off there, Terry? They didn't even know you were coming, and we've got a, 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 a lot of people. Watching. Yeah, which one did you finish with? Uh, Robert Law. Okay. Uh, million Lay Down? Edward. Right. Edward. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Carrie Kotsack. Chris Melvin, James Wyndham, uh, Coffee, Masan, and I guess that's part of it. I Jebenau, maybe. Marty oh, does a good job of writing them down. Yeah, we yeah. can't pronounce yeah. them. Yeah. Richard Panzella and Alex Palaclose, uh, Julian Foley Sr., Camellia Hafizes. Havasi. Havasi. Yeah. Okay. Harry Horsfall. Mustaf Al Dawani, yeah. yeah, Ismail Martinez, Jason Miller, Linda Zales, Kim Kitt, Jerry Lamont, Horvath Artillo. Artillo. I'll read the rest there. Okay. Am Ambria Deshka, uh, Jerry Sampson's watching. We got Ifanau Ank, Norman Fay, Costas Papalakis. Uh, Cliff Watson, I know Cliff is in uh, Australia. Rebecca Vicknar, Tom Celentano, thank you. William Whiting, uh, you met William Whiting? I don't think so. You, you will. Uh, William wants to meet you. He's a snowbird. He's up in Michigan right now. And uh, Amanda Chambers, what a nice list of people watching today. A lot of newcomers there. Uh, and uh, so let's get into a little bit about the this Apollo 17. There's Ron Evans. He passed away a few years ago, probably one of the unsung astronauts that you don't know much about, Ron. He was the command module pilot, orbited the moon some 70 times. Yep. Uh, what you got there, buddy? Well, Rebecca Vicknair is watching in that, and her son is a future astronaut. Lane. Lee. Lane. He told me his name, Lane. Yeah, and there's a picture of him in All his right. astronaut attire. So. All right, Lane. Uh, and uh, thank you for who and who's who's the mother, Rebecca your, Vicknair. That's your daughter. Yes, Rebecca Vicknair. All right, yeah. where she live? In just north of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ah, and yeah, you, when are you gonna be bring me back some gumbo? That's the I next mean, next I miss, trip. I next miss trip. good gumbo. I'm telling yeah. you. And of course, I was with Jay Honeycutt. He's a Louisiana okay guy too, for sure. So. Uh, well, let's look at some pretty pictures to get Marty to share a little bit about. There's the two astronauts that were on the moon, Gene Cernan, and that's Jack Schmidt on the right. We lost Gino a couple of Decembers ago, uh, and Harrison Schmidt is 87 years old. Uh, Charlie Duke is 87. They're the two youngest of the four that are alive. Uh, Duke's a little bit younger, and so we would have the other two are that are moonwalkers alive of the 12. Don't recall. You so. know. No. Thank <laughs> Buzz. Oh, yeah, Buzz, yeah. Buzz I had dinner clear. with him a couple years ago. So and yeah. uh, 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 David Scott. Oh, okay. Apollo 15 yep. on there. And that, isn't that sad? Twelve men walked on the moon, four or left. Yeah. And uh, in, in 87, shoot, I hope to make 87. That's the youngest. 
Uh, oh, what I want to show here is we're going to look at some pictures that were taken on the moon. You can go to Flickr, has Apollo archives, and every picture that was taken uh, is like on a film roll strip. Okay. Like, like they scanned it like on the film roll strip with the sprocket holes and everything on some of them. And at the beginning of every roll of film is a test pattern so that they can calibrate that film for color and everything else in a photography way and tom usiak is very familiar with these type of test patterns so these were actually shot in on houston on the first frame of these film they loaded up so that when they, they took pictures on the moon they could judge the exact just colors. just like we used to get on late night tv because tv didn't show overnight <laughs> that, that, that does look like a test band the screen test, there. test pattern would come up and uh, many of the pictures that you are famous like this one of uh harrison schmidt falling back into the seat there you see it had some light strike on it across there and they cleaned that up now i find this interesting three rovers on the moon right correct uh uh who are the people that drove the three rovers on the moon what would have been harrison schmidt and cernan what i'm driving at is who is in the left hand driver's seat oh Never a pilot. The commander always drove. Okay. And and uh, I think so, so uh, been what, Cernan and uh, Cernan uh, uh, Scott and um, uh, Scott was the first one, and then sixteen was John Young, and then okay. Cernan. Yeah. They never let their other buddy drive the wheel. Okay. And I asked Charlie Duke that. I said, "Did you ever drive the rover?" And he said, "No, John didn't want anyone else to drive the rover." Well, that's like landing landing an orbiter. They have a pilot, yeah. but the commander lands it. Yeah. All the pilot does is push the, the well, landing. Well, no, right? on the way down, you'll hear him that the commander turns it over to the pilot for a few seconds, and then he takes it back. Okay. <laughs> But uh, I thought, I thought, gee, Charlie, he didn't like you to take it for a spin. And he goes, nope. He said, had something to do with if something happened to it, they wanted to just track it back to one person. <laughs> and, uh, did you ever hear that story, Marty? No. Yeah. Well, yeah. are you going to send a mechanic up there to fix it? If well, I wish Marty it? had, so I'm not telling tales. But no, yeah. I did have, uh, because of Marty and the Grumman guys, I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to uh, Charlie Duke. Who's, have you? Yes. Charlie, yeah, just yeah, a great to... guy, huh? Yeah. I mean, yeah. What a wonderful guy. So we love looking at the lunar module here. Marty can point out maybe some of the junk there that's around there that they left on well, the he's, moon. He's got a, We've com got a comment got on a our UCAC hot microphone there. Yeah, Doug Forrest said the, the PLIS setup prevented them from switching seats in the, uh, the rover. The PLIS prevented them. The what? what? The PLIS. The backpack. The, the backpack. backpack. Yeah. Was, was what? The backpack was Instead different. prevented them switching seats in the LRV. Oh, okay. Well, all right. And he, uh, I, I trust he knows that because he loves sketching things in detail <laughs> yeah. like that. Why would the backpack be different, though, between the two guys? Another wonderful mystery well, of 50 rem years. Remember then, the early space, everything, their suit, everything was built for that specific astronaut. They yeah. weren't interchangeable from astronaut to astronaut. That didn't happen until in the shuttle program. And if you look at these rovers, they actually just have a lawn chair in there. Correct. So maybe they put a more uh, a different lawn chair. Well, this is Florida. You expect yeah. them to have something else than a, <laughs> Marty, a web you got, chair? Yeah, exactly. Marty, you got any comment about not that, that picture? Because I know you will on that one. You have any comment about that photograph? And your lunar module number five sitting on the surface of the moon? Yeah, sorry, I don't. We, we actually, actually didn't we... see pictures like this for maybe almost a week or two weeks after they came back from the moon. This was film. Nothing was broadcast to us there. What are those uh, stri uh, those uh, cables or, or ropes hanging off around there that we see? Laying on the floor there, on the ground. and I thought they would... Uh, like releases to, to, to uh, lower down the experiments okay well here's, here's another, another picture it's got uh interesting uh, artifact there you rarely see in a photo what's that marty the diving board you didn't yeah, pack it so you don't know it okay no, i have no idea well uh i don't either i thought uh we'll have to get well, some just to... just like shuttle it's such a complicated vehicle that no one knows every aspect of it. I mean, it's it's built from millions of parts and multiple contractors. So 
Yeah, I'm surprised at the things he does know that weren't part of Grumman. They're exactly there. And, and you know, uh, John Tribe spoke about that at lunch today. Was I said, did you work with so-and-so? I met him. And he says, yeah, I know him, but I don't know what he did. He says, Mark, I was just focused. He goes, you only had one job. You only had one job to do, and that was it. And you didn't know the guy sitting beside you, his job at yeah. all. Yeah. Because you, you, you had to do 100% focused on your job. And that translated, this work ethic translated into the shuttle work, yes. uh, work yeah. systems. Yeah. And you had, you know, that's what you were responsible for. And that's what you had to concentrate on. And eventually you may get to cross train into some of the other systems. But, mm -hmm. and you have another question. Yes, Marty. Uh, first of all, there's this, this two, oh, Cook Boris has a comment. He says uh, there were bags on the outside, Eleanor which were on the outside of each astronaut. They wouldn't fit if they were in the middle. Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, the, uh, uh, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I think he's saying that they had uh, sample bags and stuff hanging off of Schmidt and stuff like that, 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 that yeah, in there. So I'll call you up about that, Doug, and, and uh, that's very interesting. Okay, and Neil1030 says, are there any plans for Artemis astronauts to revisit the Apollo landing sites? Hmm. The Apollo landing sites were in the ocean. On the moon. Oh, on the moon to go visit those sites. At, not that I have read so far. They're not planning on going back to any of those. So, yeah, uh, Apollo 17 did a lot of mapping of future landing sites. So the goal is to harvest water or ice more technically in the South Pole in craters that don't see sunlight. Uh, I do know that there was movement to make these landing sites uh, historical preserved sites like 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 we do national American sites on there. But this is international. This is the moon. We can't claim the moon. So if the Chinese want to go up there and take take a uh, part of Apollo 17 back with them. I, who's going to stop them, you know, type of thing. But there is supposed to be a respectful uh, international, like uh, international waters treaty that everyone respects within one mile of, of, of these six landing sites. Uh, be a gentleman and don't land anything that close is what it is. Because the tourists are going to, when we, when we hit Musk and, and Bezos going to the moon with tourism, they're going to drive rovers right up to them. And and just like, just like and they do in other national monuments, they're going to take a sample. Exa I think so. Marty, what else do we have on that UCAC hot mic? Yeah, Amanda Chambers is asking, how many days could the Apollo spacecraft support the astronauts on the moon? Great question, Amanda Chambers. Marty, you want to ask that? Answer that? Well, on the extended duration, which was Apollo, Apollo 15, 16, 17, Three days. Three, Three days. days. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the ones, ones before, before could not stay that long because they didn't have enough oxygen and food packed in there. Uh, so imagine. Yeah, and, and a, NASA never wanted to go down to the very last day. So if it was three days, there was another day. If there's, there was an issue that delayed anything, it's just like all the shuttle missions, there was a little bit of time at the end of the mission, but they never wanted to use that. So Good point, Terry. Ex excellent Some point. point. Yeah, uh, it wouldn't have been four days. So no. There'd be a little bit of contingency. I mean, there's not going to have a problem lifting off. There's no, it's not a weather issue on the moon. No. Nope. It's just a matter of having a command module overhead. At the right time. Uh, Marty, how would you characterize the size of inside the lunar module? Uh, like a small bathroom uh, or, 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 or your, your, your clothes closet? It's a big clothes closet. Yeah, well, uh, well, <laughs> well, 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 well why I'm saying that is I want people to imagine three days camping on the moon and, and you're spending seven hours in the desert uh, doing uh, in a spacesuit, and then you come in for uh, 14 hours uh, or 17 hours, I guess. Uh, so, uh, what kind of how close are Terry and I to each other here, type of thing? Well, that's if you don't have a spacesuit on, if you just did like a technician engineer inside the cabin, there's room for the two of you in there, and if somebody can get behind you sitting on the engine cover. But when you hash not and you're in your spacesuit, that's just enough room for the two of you. You don't have much shoulder room. Uh, it's adequate, but 
it's not a whole lot of extra room. Hmm. Always seen me, Terry, like a lot of intuitive in the training that like you get used to like, you know, uh, I'm always turning to the right or or whatever. Or, or Depending the, on where your seat uh, is, yes. And, and think about being left-handed and right-handed too. Yes. But uh, re remember, with the exception of, of uh, Schmidt, all of these were former test pilots. They were used to flying aircraft, different type of aircraft, and they're in a seat with no way to move around, walk around or anything. Granted, their flight wasn't three days long, but mm -hmm. still, they were used to that type of confined space and working in it. Good point. And that's why they, they signed up for the mission. Correct. All right. They knew all about Marty, what I love about this photograph of your, your grummies is the tape. You know, all right, let's get some more tape on this. I don't think it's going to hold down enough. Marty, give me that roll of tape over there. <laughs> am I accurate, Marty? Or am I being too... Well, I'm not really sure what you're asking, but that it's... I, I see the tape, tape on the uh, yeah. tape, tape down, down there. there. I'm, I'm just, just saying, saying uh, some of us would think it'd be more of a professional-looking job. Well, it was. I don't really recall it being, but, let's say, that sloppy. No, I'm, not saying, well, I'm just saying you, you had, had to get, get it on there. there. Yeah, yeah. And, and remember, a lot of things were taped in spacecraft because they were temporary installations. Mm -hmm. So they weren't a permanent thing. But if that is a, a mylar type tape, it, it wrinkles real easy. It's hard to get that smooth unless you apply a lot of pressure. And that Apollo lunar lander was a very fragile vehicle. Mm -hmm. So you didn't want to go pushing a lot on it. That's uh, taped to the... Uh... It's said to Inconel. Inconel. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to think of the name. You can just Inconel. put your hand on and push it, and, and you'll dent it. Inconel, uh, the structure of it. There's the beautiful background we have there. And there is Gene Cernan on the moon. And Terry, tell us how we know that, that that's Gene Cernan and not Schmidt. You got me. So, like I said, I wasn't oh, I working on Apollo. So. Uh, the stripes on his uh, suit. Uh, in the shuttle era, they uh, they just they realized they didn't on the moon. They realized who was Buzz and who was Neil in the pictures without them asking them. Yeah. Of course, they knew Neil had the camera, so they knew that one. But it's more twelve. So the commander has the stripes on his arms, his helmet, and his legs, so they could tell the difference there. That's and, that's like the stripe on the left hand booster, not the right hand booster. That's right. So you, you taught can tell me the that. difference. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So many little innuendos. In fact, we've got artwork in. We're going to talk about of Ann Miklos, who is a structural engineer, and Ann, uh, and you're going to teach me too. She looked up at a picture and, and so oh, that's Columbia, and I go, well, how do you know it's Columbia launch and I go, you, you know, because the inside black on the, on the, the on that the Terry told me yeah. on the wing. She goes, well, not so much that, but it's got black at the tip of the tail where it's they the had a camera. Oh, it's the only one that had the silt spot at the very top of the vertical. Because yes. you had a camera up there, yeah. she said. Yeah. yeah. And then, so we're going to talk. More. I love that kind of stuff. But while we're talking about it, Terry, did each orbiter have distinctive marks on it? And I, I expect the uh, Enterprise looked a lot different. From, oh, it did. And it, did, it did had hardly any tile on it. So, you know, it was <clears throat> uh, not built to fly into space, so it didn't need we'll, the insulation. We'll do a show one day with you on that. Yeah. Put all five orbiters counting. Yeah, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, there are a few differences, but basically Columbia was the one that had the, the silts pod, the black wings and that, and the others. So you could tell at a distance it. The others, you had to get a closer look to tell. Hmm. Well, we're enjoying looking back a retrospect of Apollo 17 launched 50 years ago today, a half century. Uh, Terry and I are both around. Marty Winkle was working on Grumman there. So we hope that you're enjoying a little look back at stuff. Glad to have Terry here at his perspective uh, and, uh, and all of you out there enjoying us today on Stay Curious. Uh, here's a, another beautiful picture. Uh, I guess I'm emphasizing here that... Uh, the antennas oh yeah i know what i want to show on this one was you get these pictures on Flickr, and you can do anything with them you the government taxpayer paid for these pictures you can do anything you want with them i, I think you can't make money off of it okay in some way there's but but they are government paid and you can enhance them so this is the raw image on the Flickr account and then i jazzed it up a little bit and you can see just back and forth there, oh, not back and forth there like that, back and forth there. There's the original, and I popped some contrast and color in it to make it look a little bit better. So, and you can see how the, look at the mountains and the lunar soil as I took uh, 
some uh, uh, brightness away from that highlights so uh, you can have a lot of fun with that cropping them and you'll see some of the classic pictures like the visor shot of Buzz Aldrin on the moon and Neil and the lamb in the visor uh, that is usually cropped at his feet but that is actually uh, what you see there's about a third more of the picture where you can see the, okay. the lunar uh, you can see the lunar pole laying down there the contact pole and so forth so uh, love this picture Terry uh, you know, taken by one of the astronauts. It might have been Gene because I don't see stripes on that one in the distance. Uh, somebody's at an angle there, you know. <laughs> but uh, I just, you know, you're 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 probably a couple football fields away from that 23 foot tall structure called the lunar module there. Okay. And again, uh, the camera was uh, operated autonomously and that, that uh, antenna broadcast the images back live to Earth. Uh, there was cable networks were not in existence in 1972, so nobody watched these. You know, I mean, it just, uh, they, but they did broadcast them and there's hours of uh, archived videos of them. Geologists would actually zoom in on a rock and tell the astronaut, hey, would you go over there and pick that one up? Because we see some characteristics yeah. of that. So it was truly exploration uh, at its best. Yeah, and the, and the the broadcasters of the day could not broadcast the good images. That There were some excellent images coming back from the moon, but the equipment that, that the news media had to broadcast it out to TV and that was poor. So even though they got a real good image in, they didn't get that clear of an image until later when NASA released them. Exactly. All kinds of experiments put out on 17. They had mortars that had uh, ch charges on them, which uh, all kind of pyrotechnics taken to the moon. Uh, they would drill into it. Uh, and those of you asking for Christmas some sort of power tool, uh, I guarantee you, Gary, uh, Terry, there's probably no power tool sold with an electric cord on them. <laughs> I think they're all NICAD batteries now. Just I could about, be wrong. Just about. But, yeah. but 50 years later, guess who was using the first NICAD batteries to drill on the moon? And, and the astronauts, These astronauts designed a lot of those tools. Mm -hmm. I believe Black & Decker started out with the first battery-operated drill, but the astronauts improved it. And the earlier astronauts designed a lot of the tools that they were going to use on their spacewalks. I wish I could ask Harrison Schmidt. Uh, I forget, I've been next time I'm around him. I'm going to ask him if he took his Geology 101 hammer with him, because I've known some geologists that had made a career out of it, yes. and they cherished their first hammer that they bought in class, and that would be something to take to the moon for sure if he had it. This is looking out the Lem windows like Marty did so many times. Uh, Lem number twelve. Looking in the distance at the uh, science uh, uh, ALSEP, Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Package, set up there, and you see the donuts done there. And the, uh, uh, <laughs> that'd be fun to do a couple donuts on yes. the moon, wouldn't it? Yep. Uh, Terry, have you ever thought about if you're on the moon, what you would do? Uh, I'm you not a I'm not it? a golfer, so I'm not going to try it for the longest drive. But uh, it it would just be. An amazing experience to go there and you know to walk around on it and just imagine people living there mm -hmm. one day yeah a couple of famous stories with john young asked about the moon uh in, in a time john uh uh john um, mcbride uh no uh mccully mike okay. mccully talks about being in the back seat of a t-38 him and my uh, and the pilot, of course, is John Young. They're flying around for a night launch of the shuttle. The moon's out. McCulley said to uh, John Young, John, uh, never asked you this before, but what was it like to be on the moon? And and he paused so long that McCulley in the story that is on YouTube says he thought that he, didn't, he was going to key the mic again because he didn't think John heard him. And John Young come back after being asked what it was like to walk on the moon. He told Mike McCulley, it was one weird place. <laughs> it sounds like him. That was all he said. It was one weird place. Yeah. <laughs> and you've been around John Young a lot. We miss him. Uh, look at the, like I'm telling you on these uh, 
uh, flicker, they've got the, the number of the negative on the on the side there. Uh, of course, you always have to improvise no matter how hard you plan. And uh, the fender came off and sprayed like a rooster tail, just this, this regolith that's finer than talcum powder. That's the big thing going back to the moon is this is finer than talcum powder. It's going to get into everything. Look at the leg of of uh, Schmidt there uh, covered with dust. Uh, so they put an old map in, 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 uh, in good old duct tape <laughs> and fixed it there. So And a couple other pretty pictures we got going here. Uh, what, I hit the O. I hope the O didn't do anything. Uh, that goes back. And uh, just look at how close the edge of a crater there. That's where they found the orange soil that was a little fissure of glass globules of, of or, uh, igneous rock uh, maybe three, four million years ago. Uh, that's the thing that gets me is you are walking on an area that has been literally undisturbed, not for hundreds of years, not for thousands of years, but for millions of years. The only thing that's disturbed it is the constant bombardment from micrometeorites that are dust motes going 30,000 miles an hour, and they make little impacts. And, and constantly. some big meteorites. And yeah. some big ones there. there there's one of the big, uh, this is why they went there, was they saw a lot of rocks that had tumbled down one of the massifs there. And uh, how could you resist not photographing the blue marble from the surface of the moon there? And I love the shadow play. Lots of astronauts took shadows of themselves. And it emphasized, Terry, when they landed on the moon, it was uh, like uh, if sun rises at 7 o'clock today, they're landing on the moon at 8, 8.30. They wanted those long shadows Yes. to see all the detail they could uh, on the moon there. And this supposedly is, um, oh, there's an awesome shot out the, the window, Marty. Uh Showing the backpacks thrown out. Look how dirty that backpack is. So wherever man goes, we throw our rubbish, Terry. Yes. You know. and, I, and I understand that fine dust gets in all the joints of the suits. And eventually it sets up like concrete. So yeah. all those suits are hard to move in anyway if you'd ever tried on one of those gloves. So, you know, <clears throat> that's one of the challenges of going back to the moon. How do you prevent all that dust from getting inside where you're going to live? And how do you clean the suits? I mean, you can't just get out of the suit and then start wiping it off and cleaning it because now you're exposed to all that dust. So they have a lot of challenges that, that the general public hasn't even considered before they go back to the moon. Yeah, the getting into the machinery. Um, they, uh, I know that the University of Tennessee is one of the leaders of, of artificial lunar regolith. That's why I've been around... Harrison Schmidt, he talks down in there uh, every uh, every year, usually. Harrison Jack Schmidt's middle name? Anybody say what it is, Marty? Yep. Hagen. H-A-G-A-N. Huh. Hagen. Yep. You don't hear that name very often. Yep. Harrison Hagen Smith. Don't know Schmidt. Don't know where that came from. But, um, yes, one of the solutions, Terry, they're looking at is because there are microscopic globules of volcanic igneous rock in all the lunar regolith. The, the lunar volcanoes weren't like the cone volcanoes on Earth. They were like fissures that bubbled up. And, and the consistency of that lunar uh, lava was like a 10-weight oil, okay. uh, motor oil, not like molasses, more like a, a, a thin motor oil. And uh, so with this, this, this glass actually in this rock what they've done is taken a microwave energy like a lawnmower it's a microwave uh oven and that melts this regolith down then it melts it down at a certain temperature of, of microwaves that they can maybe make uh, paths solidify and, and solidify yeah. it to, to pack it down on there uh, other uh, yeah otherwise they're looking at at two or three uh, uh, you walk into you. You're on a, you're on a, a space a moonwalk. You come in and there's one, well, like the people up north have a snow room. Yes. All right. Uh, that's a porch attached to the porch. All right, yeah. where everybody comes in, and then you go into the next room, and then maybe the third room is finally when you you can take off all your clothes. But that kind type of fine, uh, 
uh, uh, dust could be a respiratory problem for yes. humans too. Yes. Mesothelioma and, mm -hmm. and asbestos poisoning. Uh, this is a huge unknown of breathing this in. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so surprised we didn't hear it from the 12 moon walkers. Yeah. When they, because, you know, they didn't have separate rooms to go into. They came back in their dusty suit. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, into the, into the lunar module. Well, so. and several commanders I know uh, said, uh, stop. You're coming in the tunnel, get that stuff off. You're yeah. not coming in my clean yeah. command module like yeah. that. I've, I've heard a couple stories like that. I actually think Collins said that to him. Yeah. Uh, the, the first guy's like, you guys don't realize how dirty you are. We can't have that in here. Get in there. <laughs> yeah, because we have to live with it for a couple more some days. Of the, some of the suits, I, I think they brought back all the suits. Yeah, they had to wear them. Yeah. Yeah, that was the other thing. They had, the, that was their, that was the only suit they had. So on re-entry, they had to put them back on. So... That had to be nasty. Three oh, they days. Did, they that. did put back on the one, the same one they'd walked on the moon for reentry. I'm a little I, confused I, I, I about that. I wasn't aware because I never I, I'm was a, a suit I'm tech, a little so. confused about that, Marty. No, I think they wore it for reentry. Just had to wear it to get back into the lunar module. Okay. Until you dock with the command module. And they had another suit for reentry in the command module. That is something I want cleared up because I'm uncertain about that. I believe that, but Marty says that they had too. Well. This is supposedly, well, it is, because I looked at the roll of film on Flickr. The last photograph of a human being image on an alien world. Gene Cernan, when he was about to turn around and go up the ladder, turned around and took this last shot of his shadow on the moon. That's Taurus Litro Mountains in the background there. I think that's pretty cool, Terry. It is. In 50 years, we've never seen that again. And But when we do see it... We're going to see it like an NFL football broadcast with 25 cameras on the lunar on the lander, and it'll be in broadcast. And a half a dozen it. drones. Yeah, half a dozen drones going on and so forth on there. So, uh, Terry, it's all about, to me, this, our, our flag on the moon. We didn't claim it, all right. No, but, it's just that we were there. But we were there. Uh, Chinese have their flag on the moon on uh, an unmanned rover on the backside of the moon. And uh, Russian flag is on there on several of their unmanned uh, rovers. Several of them did uh, send back uh, four ounces of uh, lunar soil autonomously, which is nothing to be sneezed at doing that. Correct. On there. But we haven't had, uh, uh, and there was a, uh, uh, China brought back some, uh, they had a, 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 the lander, an orbiter that was four different spacecrafts, and they brought back a couple ounces on there so the total amount of lunar soil brought back to earth is about 950 pounds from apollo and about uh five ounces from from uh russia and china on and there and my understanding is is some of that that was brought back by apollo still hasn't been analyzed no it has not that's yeah, a that, good that, point it's, it's stored and they eventually turn over a little bit more at a time for different universities and companies to go analyze and study and so and you know an interesting aspect of that why, why save it uh terry is technology all right the apollo 11 rocks 50 years ago they brought back 47 pounds of rock so maybe they kept uh 30 pounds of it and we're not going we're not even going to consider looking at this for 25 years well, in 25 years, the spectrometer that analyzes rocks has increased. much improved. Right? Yes. And, then, and 50 years later, there is a, a whichamacallit that we didn't even think about inventing yeah. that is now analyzed, and particularly true in medicine. But uh, a lot of disciplines in science are like that, is they will save something so that it can be analyzed by future generations like, in the more advanced uh, Like they material. do with, with things from crimes. Yeah. They save it, there and you then know. a new technology comes out, and they go back and look at that, that Great sample point, they have. Great uh, point, Terry. The cold cases that are being yes. solved yes. decades Just, later because yes. they harvested DNA, and there is no way to analyze that. Yeah, Marty, what, what we got a comment on today? Another well, one. We got a question and a comment. First, a comment from Doug Forrest. He said, one space suit only. And I'm not disputing Doug, but uh, I would have thought that you had an EVA suit, which is what you walk on the moon, and you... I'm, I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm, I'm with Doug. Doug. I, I think, think one, one suit, suit only, only too. too. But, but but we'll look but, into that, but, Marty. But but it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a lunar 
a, a suit that walked on the moon that they re-entered in, to my knowledge. Yes, I think it is. They only had one one, one Apollo suit to, to go to the moon for launch and landing and walk on the moon. Now, um, when you see... Yeah, but uh, what, what about the time they were in on the two days coming back from the moon? They they didn't stay in that suit the whole time. No, they, but they had to stow them and put them on for reentry. Yeah, I don't... I don't uh, and, and they, they were dirty and nasty. And you think of the EVAs that the three command module pilots did to retrieve the, the film. Yes. Uh, there's one where uh, I think on, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Uncle Al Warden is wearing a striped helmet. All right. Because uh, his commander's helmet, because that would have fit. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and, and uh, fit him to go out on there because his helmet wasn't properly for, uh, for EVA. EVA. Yeah. And, and uh, Jim Irwin had to wear his because he was the astronaut in there. But that's a great program for us to look into, Marty. You will have to look it up. But you said something earlier, which I've also heard with the command module pilot had the commander and, his, and the LMP take their space, space suits off. Because he didn't want all that moon dirt inside the command module. Correct. So then, what did they, what did they use for reentry? Oh, they, well, no, they took them off in the lunar module and had to clean them up some. In other words, kind of shake them out, and 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 get the loose stuff off of it. And then they had to stow it somewhere in the command module to put on for reentry. Remember that command module inside. I'll tell, I'll tell you what, Marty. I know, I know. We will settle this dispute one way, <laughs> but uh, we will ask Mister. Uh, 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 Astronaut uh, uh, Charlie Duke, you, you're we're, you're going to see Charlie in February at the Flying no, Ground. Not, not Charlie Duke. We'll see him in April. Oh, April. April. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll find out before yeah. that. Yeah, we'll, we'll find out before that. Contact from uh, to Fred Hayes. But yeah, yeah Fred Hayes, and, and, and uh, I know Nick Thomas will have an opinion about it uh, out there. But yeah, uh, I'm with Doug. I think they had one suit. They didn't have two. And it was a nasty, dirty suit they had to put back on for reentry. Yeah, some and, of the suit techs from shuttle had been suit techs for Apollo. So when I see them, I'll ask them to. This is what is so cool about the American Space Program: its complexity, yet its simplicity. And uh, so uh, we're going to look into that for y'all out there to stay Thank curious. curious. One, one question from Mark Isiak. One, one other shot, shot here. here of, yes, yes, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, all right. Question gets to Terry. Terry, did they have a tail camera on Columbia operating for every mission? No, they did not. Tail camera on Columbia. Yeah, it's what's called the silts pod, and we were supposed to remove it, but we didn't come up with a time and a flow. It was no longer active, but uh, we never got time in one of our processing flows to take that off and put the other tip of the vertical back on. So the previous tip of the vertical still exists. Huh, that's interesting. Did uh, that perhaps survive the disaster? Was that you remember? Did the filth pod survive it? No, I never saw. Heck yeah, I never saw. I'm, I'm sure that high up, I never saw, but I never saw parts of it. <clears throat> and it wasn't part of the investigation, so they didn't lay it out on the floor. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Well, here is the descent stage of the. Uh, Lunar module, it was called uh, Challenger. The lunar orbiter was, uh, I mean, the command module was uh, America that Ron Evans was in. Um, I did wear the right shirt then, Challenger. The, yeah, you did. There you <laughs> go, buddy. Yes, TS-8 on there. Uh, and you see the footprints, actually. This is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's still orbiting the moon. Uh, from uh, And so you got a good perspective there. Uh, you're looking at an area of about maybe three football fields, something like that, maybe a quarter mile is where they put that else up on there. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Terry, uh, once in a while, uh, someone comes in the museum and, and wants to uh, uh, either say that the Earth is flat or that we didn't go to the moon, you know. And uh, so uh, me being very confident uh, in coming up with a wonderful glib remark that, you know, one, if we didn't go to the moon, how come the Russians aren't complaining about it? All right. Correct. And number two, if we didn't go to the moon, uh, uh, what about all these artifacts and, and how can 500,000 people keep a secret? Yes. But really, the good question is, if we didn't go to the moon, 
I want Marty to give back his pension <laughs> and his salary. And and all these people made great money working overtime. If we didn't, if the moon race was a hoax, several. Hundred, I want that money back. Several hundred thousand <laughs> people around this country. I mean, a, a lot of the public thinks that that the space program is between Houston, Huntsville, and Kennedy Space Center. Right. But those vehicles were built by companies all across this country. I mean, the orbiter or the space shuttle was built in 48 of our 50 states. On so, purpose, um, too. They wanted every part of, uh, of America involved with the shuttle as cor- well as correct, Apollo. Correct, but Apollo was built all over the country mm-hmm. and, uh, and then assembled here at Kennedy Space Center for launch. Marty, Marty you, you got to sign, sign over your pension check to me this month? I will do that, and I'll give you a check for all the money I made during the Apollo program if we did not go to the moon. Okay. Even Mythbusters, they proved that everything, including the moving flag and all that, Mythbusters did a show on it, and they proved everything that they said was feasible to happen on the moon. Well, uh, I had a good high school friend of mine get mad at me because I told him he was un-American. He he was a moon hoaxer, and yeah. and I said you're you're not an American if 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 you say that. I mean, g- get out of here. Don't tell and, Buzz and, that. Uh, and uh, right, yeah, he <laughs> knocked the age seventy. Buzz Aldrin smacked a guy in a hotel lobby more than wanted, once. They yeah. wanted him to put his hand on a Bible. Uh, this guy was going around. I, you all know the story. We don't we don't promote those people like that. They're entitled. To their opinion is what I'll say, and uh, and then privately I'll say to myself, seek help. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, Marty. That and you can't fix stupid. stupid. There <laughs> you go, Marty. Well, we certainly have had a a wonderful program today. That nothing stupid about it. Going on the moon fifty years ago. Uh, I of course love uh, always emphasizing the great Apollo workers like Marty that did this. 50 years ago, it's not been matched since. It's just... And uh, and, just... And, and my dad, Bob White, that worked Apollo, so... Yeah. Oh, did your dad, Bob White? What, yeah. what did he do? Well, he was in the logistics world in Apollo, but yeah, I had him and uh, two of my cousins. Well, I really didn't know you were a second-generation space worker. Yeah. And now there's a third. My son, Travis, is in the Army Space Command. Right. So we're third generation. Right. Good to see you, Travis, watching today uh, as we sprung... Uh, sprung you in here on a, on a big surprise here, Terry White. Thank you for enhancing our, our retrospect of the Apollo 17 moon landing. Uh, Marty, do we have a guest tomorrow? Uh, Mr. Donnelly? Or... Oh, um, Rick Davion. He's oh, going to be here tomorrow. tomorrow. Good. Art Davion? Oh, no, 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 Rick, no, not Rick. I'm sorry. It's uh, Daryl Higginbotham. Okay. okay, I'll give him a call tonight and verify it. Okay, okay. We're, and do you know Daryl Higginbotham? Mm-hmm. Yeah. With the... and, and Rick Davion? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and I met then, Rick the other day. And, and and while we're talking birthdays, happy birthday, Travis. His is this weekend. All That's right. It, so. All right, Travis. Uh, Dad will have a nice big thing in there, and uh, uh, this will be a very special birthday for you, Travis. I know he's not been in, in America the last couple birthdays, has he? Correct. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, he just got back from his deployment in September. So thank you for your service to our country, young man. We're glad that it's almost over, over there in that hellhole of the world. Correct. Uh, how old is Travis going to be? <laughs> oh, 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 he was born in eighty-seven. So oh, okay, yeah. eighty-seven. All right. Well, that's that's uh, thirty-five. Yeah, yeah, thirty-five. All right. That's that's a great age to be. All right. Well, thank you all for being here today. Marty, anything to clean up on our Streamlabs show here? Nope, we're good. Well, thank you for your contribution, Marty, on our Tom and Mark and uh, Vicki Usiak hot mic here that they provide the funds to buy. And I appreciate that because Marty always has something important to say. I, after all, am just a space geek that loves being around these two guys and talking about America's great space program. And we're going to do some more of that next uh, tomorrow. All right. And uh, thank our, our whole staff here. And always got to give a shout out to our, our wonderful leader, Karen Conklin. And we want to thank everybody that tuned in to watch the show. Thank you very much. Great list of y'all here, some newcomers. We're going to eventually switch it from Facebook. We'll still be on Facebook, but YouTube uh, is where we want you to watch it. So, I uh, hope you get some inf- uh hope you've enjoyed it very much with these personal stories from Chris Callie, Terry White, Marty Winkle, 
And we'll do it again tomorrow. Until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying, I can't wait to see you again to what? Bridge, the space between us.